to 95% this past school year, saying that they feel like there is a staff member, some adult at our school, where they feel like their student can come to them with a problem. So that really, again, is so important to us and drives that data when it comes to that learning community. We love seeing that response from our families. Um, and the other one is that we're saying that 93% of our families um, agree or strongly agree that we at our school have high expectations for all of our students. So those are celebrations that come from that school quality data that I just wanted to lift up, that we do still take that feedback to you know, um, embed within our goals, uh, but really to celebrate those, those highest ranking things on the survey. I would have to double check that number. I want to say it was around like 80 from that year, but I would have to fact check that. Yeah. Also, the data that we're looking at are what are those areas within the school quality survey that also our parents and um, guardians are saying, okay, these are the areas that maybe when it comes to like we disagree or strongly disagree, these are the top two, okay? And so the way you would look at this data is that we actually want the percentage to be small, okay? So because this is really saying that when it comes to discipline is enforced fairly. Well, that was one of the top survey responses. It was actually the top one, right? We're saying 23% of our families said that they strongly disagreed um, or disagree with that. We would actually like to see that percentage get as close to zero as possible. So again, we're using that data and that feedback to help drive our goals when it comes to like our positive behavior intervention and supports. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, okay? Um, the other area that kind of came up on our survey was that this will offer students a variety of activities and courses. So again, we're really hoping that parents, uh, maybe through more communication and bringing awareness to, what are those learning opportunities that we have at our school? How are the things that we're doing when we call learning on location? How is that connected to providing a robust curriculum and education for their student? So again, while we want to see that small, we're always striving to get it to as close to 0% as possible. But we also know that that's a hard number to move, but we're gonna keep chipping away at that. So if, to address uh, that first school quality um, data survey result that talked about discipline being enforced fairly. Some things that we looked across our learning community with the PBIS system from last year. So last year was really the launch year for us for PBIS. Um, this year we took that and we wanted to say, how can we get better? How can we help and be more consistent across our system no matter what grade? Because right, we're DK through five, we also have specials and different roles within the building. So one thing that we worked hard as a staff was on what we call the continuum of consequences. So that's a snapshot there of our teachers um, gathered and collaborated. They talked about what are just general classroom behaviors that we see, what are ways that we manage those behaviors, we problem solve, we shared ideas, and then we sorted them. We're like, okay, so out of these behaviors, which of these behaviors would we consider to be minor behaviors? Which one are major ones that we're gonna send up to the office, right? And how do we respond to those behaviors? So that's another part of the continuum of consequences is not just when behavior occurs, right? But how are we responding? Because that's that part of that survey is that the perception is that perhaps discipline is not enforced fairly. So we wanted to make sure that as a staff, so all of our instructional teachers, we even um, provided copies and sat with our new aides because again, they're part of our system that might be you know, responding to behaviors. So as a staff, we developed what we call the continuum of consequences that really helps us determine minor classroom behaviors, how we're going to respond to them, and then those things that become major behaviors, how we also respond to that. We also added into our school system this year um, to make sure that all spaces have think sheets so that time for students to reflect and that way no matter <coughs> where you are in the building in that learning community that would again be something consistent that students would be doing no matter what grade. On the other side that we're continuing on from our PBI 
EIS initiatives from last year, we had implemented as part of our celebrations and ways to celebrate all of our positive <coughs> behaviors. Um, we developed a Wildcat Wednesday and some different Wildcat tickets that actually we reflected over the year, took feedback from our students um, on how that system was going and then continued to tweak it this uh, last year and this year. So we do have um, a multitude of different color tickets and it's color coded um, and that's what you see as a screenshot there of me. Um, I did make a video this school year as a way to again communicate with all of our families about what PBIS is, how Wildcat Wednesday works, and what our Wildcat ticket system is all about. So we have green and blue tickets that can be given out by any staff, but the green when parents get those know like they've gotten it either at recess or at lunch. Um, the pink tickets are pink principal tickets, and those are from me only. Those are also instant winners on Wildcat Wednesday. And then we also have golden tickets that we reserve for our guest teachers. Um, and the guest teachers have also given us feedback that they really love that. They love being able to be a part of our um, system and being able to recognize the behaviors as well. Um, so on Wildcat Wednesday, something very special that we have added to this school year is the addition of our brand new book vending machine. So that's what you see pictured here with Captain the Wildcat. He made a special delivery to our September PDIS assembly and we unveiled it to all the students. So students who get golden tickets or pink tickets during the week are instant winners and are invited to go and use their token at the book vending machine if that's how they would like to spend it. Um, with PDIS, we also found that it was important to continue on from last year again, just to be consistent those PBIS lessons that occurred at the start of the school year. So all of our grades, uh, DK through five, went through direct lessons with different staff to one, also make connections with them, but also to directly learn what the behavior expectations are in those different spaces. So that's one of the pictures that you see at the top as well. That's our fabulous FSL, Mrs. Pizzo, during our um, a lesson outside in the hallway where we talk about hallway expectations as well as expectations in the restrooms. So we have expectations posted in all of our spaces. All right, moving on also to our next goal is when it comes to attendance. So this is something we started to really analyze last school year. And you can see that over the last couple of years, um, our attendance hovers around like 90% full day attendance. Um, and we're right around there right now for this school year as well. So what we really drilled down to look at was how can we improve that? How can we get better full day attendance? And really it was, how do we get you to the building? We really noticed that most of our kids, if they were not attending, when we started to really look at who are the students who are not here with us, it was really students who had, um, you know, some things going on where maybe they were apprehensive coming into the building, starting the day, they were coming very late, right? So that also impacts your full day attendance. So some things that we looked at, um, I'll share in just a minute, are going to be addressing that as a way to boost our full day attendance. And we also analyzed like what days, um, you know, is maybe attendance poor. So you can see that Monday, Friday are kind of our hotspots, Friday being the lowest. So again, we're gonna share some things of what we're gonna do to try to address that, that Friday attendance um, problem. So again, like I said, one thing that we noticed was that like, if we can get you to come into school, you're gonna stay for school. And once you're there, you're gonna have full day attendance. So some things that we implemented this school year is that we've had restorative practice training. We need to understand that the use of that circle in your community allows students to have voice, feel like they're a part of that community and our teachers are using that circle structure throughout their day. Um, and so that's across our grade levels. You can see this is even like our DK, our youngest learners who um, engage in the circle every day as a way to connect and build community. They also use it when they maybe need to problem solve and address things in the classroom. And also sometimes just with the learning and teaching. Again, it's another way to, to help kids feel like they have a voice within their classroom and that what they have to say is important. We also changed some schedules around, um, starting last year and then continuing this year when we saw an improvement. One of those things is that you'll notice our Clear Lake therapy dog, Lucy. She has changed her schedule, so she's on first shift and she greets everyone at the front door. 
So that's from Handler Mrs. Gordon, and they are out there at the main doors every day. That has greatly helped a lot of our students come in, especially right now after some of these long breaks. It's nice to have the dog there to be able to start their day. And some even will walk her in a little bit, and then we can bring Lucy back out for the next person who might need that. Um, another part of our schedule that we have tweaked is the use of what we're calling morning choice time. So again, instead of having students feel stressed and maybe anxious about coming in the classroom, you know, starting right away, we're doing what's called morning choice or like a soft start. So it allows the kids to really come in, those who really need to eat breakfast, have that time and space to do it. It's another time to also connect with their uh, classmates, with their teachers. They can do like maybe some unfinished work, get some help with the homework. Again, it's greatly reduced that anxiety of trying to come in and just get right right to work or off to a special. Um, and then something else that we are starting this school year that's gonna be connected to our PDIS system to address that Friday dip in attendance is what we're gonna call PDIS PALS. And we're gonna buddy our lower grade classrooms with some upper grade classrooms. And they're gonna meet on Fridays and do some different activities throughout the school year. Again, to build community and to also give kids something to look forward to on Fridays. While we still want them to be coming in on all Fridays, we know that that could be an extra thing that like they really start to build into their system and see like it's important to be here on a Friday. And I also get to connect um, at least monthly with my pal. Um, also, we are um, really in our Clear Lake era, like I said, starting from last school year and looking at that staff wellness and retention. Um, we have staff who have varying years in the system and we really wanted to build, again, connection and community with them. So we've started doing different things monthly. As a wellness committee, we have different staff spirit days. We participate in the district spirit days. Um, we do raffles, um, we do all sorts of things. And you can also see at that top um, right picture that staff gathering in a circle. So again, we're also using that with our staff as another way to be able to check in and also build that community within the staff um, when they're here with us. And I will also talk about the mural in just a second, but I just wanted to point that out that that's our that's like our amazing 24, 25 staff out there. Okay. Moving on into our next goal when it comes to strengthening tier one instruction. Um, part of the data that we use was in-step or state assessment data. We also use local um, and district assessment data. Um, but one thing that we noticed across our system was that when it came to MSTEP and how our students were performing and the number of students proficient yearly, we can see over the last few years, so our Clear Lake data, I know it's a lot of numbers in one table, the Clear Lake data is the top table. It's showing our students that were proficient in um, English language arts and math in grades third, fourth, and fifth. And so you can see um, between the years, there's been some variation just depending on the cohort. But obviously we strive to have more than like when we look at, for example, our fifth grade 23-24 data, we strive to have more than 50% of our children proficient um, at that assessment. I did also just want to include the um, Oakland County and state data also to just show the comparison, to just show kind of across the board, across the state, we are also all struggling uh, when it comes to math and language arts. So we're not alone here in Oxford, but obviously we're using our data as well to continue to drive um, that tier one instruction and to strengthen that. So when it comes to strengthening the instruction this year, some things that we're doing is some different professional learning opportunities for our teachers and also for us as, as um, administrators. So one thing that we have done is brought in um, three times uh, for every grade um, consultants or coaches from the Advancing Literacy Group. And so they're helping to work with our teachers in like a literacy lab setting. Um, they're also using our local data to also help us focus on that instructional piece when it comes to literacy and how do we um, improve those practices within our classroom. Really our lens is also strengthening that small group instruction this year with also a phonics lens. 
Um, we as administrators are also engaging in professional learning because we know we are also instructional leaders in the building. And so some things that we have been doing is working with Oakland schools, um, with the continuous, um, committee, a continuous improvement committee um, consultants to come over and also help us as a group to again look at our data, look for look fors, really help build our capacity as well. Um, and we're also engaging in what's called the Shifting the Balance um, book study and online modules. And so really, again, that's to build our capacity when it comes to literacy. Shifting the balance is all about how we're taking the best practices from science of reading and balanced literacy and how to bring that research together to make sure and ensure that the practices that we're engaging in with students is also very high leverage and taking the most current research that's out there. Um, and then as a clear late professional learning community, we're also trying something different Again, this comes from staff feedback, um, where grade levels currently collaborate um, three times a year, but we were really hearing from them that they like to collaborate like vertically. So, um, you know, if I'm a fourth grade teacher, it'd be really nice to be able to collaborate with my colleagues outside of my grade level. So this year we have three professional learning communities that are comprised of teachers K-5, and then they, they have agency in which group they'd like to participate in. So we have a math professional learning community, um, a literacy uh, professional learning community, and a culture climate learning community. So again, all of our professional learning communities are tied back to our Clear Lake goals. And all of those groups then, um, using our district elementary instructional playbook, about you know, what are the practices and the curriculum that we expect here in Oxford. They're taking that playbook to select what is it that they wanna work on when it comes to those three different areas. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the learner, we really looked at how are we raising up to families the things that we're doing when it comes to career-focused education. And so at Clear Lake, we do offer um, a multitude of different things between your K-5 experience, um, and that is connected to what we would call career-focused education. So just bring an awareness to all the possibilities that lay ahead of you after you leave us at Clear Lake and Oxford and beyond. So some of the things that you see here is also learning on location. Um, and all of these pictures that you would see here are actually connected then to career zones. Um, so the state of Michigan recognized five different career zones, and so we're always trying to highlight and raise up to children that there are a, a vast array of different job opportunities and careers out there, and so we intentionally select and embed within our grade levels different opportunities that also align with their curriculum and standards. So some things like going third grade goes to Lansing, that's connected to their third grade Michigan <coughs> social studies um, and learning about state government. They're also then getting to go firsthand to learn about the government in that role. We take children to, like, um, the one is to the River Rouge plant that we just took fourth grade to because we know automotive is a target zone that we want to raise up to our students. We also do at Clear Lake, this will be going on, I think it might be our fourth year, of doing a career exploration day for our fifth grade students. We invite our parents, guardians, um, community members in, and they can come in and share about their career and learn, again, firsthand from someone within our community. Um, so that's been a really great way to also make connections with our local community and also our parents so that they can get in and share about their jobs and their careers. We also then embed reflection into all of this. So as our students are going through these different career-focused education activities, they're also reflecting on like, what career zone was it connected to? Um, what is something that I learned about the roles within this career zone? Um, and then they're using that to help just kind of collect their, their reflection on you know, what it was like to visit that career zone or learn about it that, um, that day. We also are striving to um, help create a very, you know, a varied experience at Clear Lake. And so when thinking about the various activities and courses that we offer, I just wanted to highlight some things that we have going on. We have an amazing green team. This is going on year 18. We're actually at evergreen status, which means that you have to do over 20 different activities mm -hmm. per the Michigan Green Schools application on a yearly basis to keep that status. So they do amazing things to help the environment and also um, you know, just bringing awareness to 
um, environmental issues at Clear Lake. We have also um, connections with, with our Spanish um, teachers. We're really looking also at what are ways we can also then have students practice and transfer that language learning. And so in fifth grade, again, we take them on a field trip. They go to the DIA to see the Afrenda's um, exhibit um, that is connected to the Day of the Dead. And then we also go to Mexican Town where students have like a scavenger hunt that engages them at various businesses in Mexican Town where they also have to use their Spanish. The entire thing is in Spanish. Um, so it's, it's a really amazing experience for the kids um, to be able to go down there and actually use their language learning in that capacity. Um, we also have a great super singers program. We actually have like our biggest group this year. I think we have like almost 45 students at Clear Lake. It's a really big group. It's amazing. Um, we also, the last time I was here, it was asking for approval to go to fifth grade camp. So I've included some pictures there. Our fifth grade camp went amazing. Um, and so that's another experience that we give our students. And then this school year, we also um, are starting our first Clear Lake Student Council. So um, I'll be able to report back, you know, the next time with updates of all the amazing things that they're doing. But that is a new club that we have added this year. I have some great teachers who are sponsoring that. All right. I am on to our points of pride at Clear Lake, and there's a lot to be proud at. Um, as a Clear Lake principal and staff member, community member, one of the things I wanna highlight is what we call our LINCS program or our peer-to-peer -peer program. This is really robust. We have, again, um, 70 students who have volunteered to participate and be a LINCS student. And this is amazing because we started this program last year and we had students continue on to this school year want to be a link because they saw how beneficial it was to not just the student that they're linked with but also to them because it works on skill building for both peers um, we also do reverse inclusion days where again you can see in that circle um, picture they engage in that connection with their peers they're also learning different skills when it comes to communication self-management social skills and for both peers and then they're practicing those things during our link program that's facilitated by our Clear Lake social worker and speech pathologist. And last year we also started the first annual, uh, we call it Pancakes with a Pail, and it was our way to celebrate with all of our Link students. So that really big picture you can see is all of our students together at the end of the year celebrating. And so we really look forward, again, having such a large group to celebrate this school year. All right, and I had shown a picture earlier in front of our amazing murals. That's also a point of pride. With the help of our Clear Lake PTO, they generously donated the funds to be able to update parts of our building. Um, and so the very top mural is in our cafeteria. So it just brings joy to everyone because it's a space that everyone goes to every day. Um, and so it's just so great to have that in there. The other mural, mural that you see down here at the bottom is for our Clear Lake Teacher of the Year to also, again, recognize and lift up our amazing staff. That's right when you come into Clear Lake on that front wall. Those murals, like I said, were donated generously by our Clear Lake PTO, and then the artwork was done by um, Oxford grad, uh, Rick Ho or Nick Hoppin. Um, some other things that I'm going to lift up as points of pride because going in October, I, you don't get to hear about all of our things that go on throughout the school year, but our points of pride for us. Um, we had a really great turnout at the top uh, right for our summer engagement series. We offered both math and reading um, activities on a weekly basis over the summer, and that was really well attended. So we like to just say that that's really a great point of pride that even our students over the summer are staying engaged and coming up to school. And some of the end of the year activities that you wouldn't have heard about, um, we have started a tradition where we look at both arts and athletics to be balanced um, at Clear Lake, that ID Learner profile. And so we do what's called a chalk walk. That's the top two pictures where students work collaboratively with their classmates and they're all provided chalk and they go out and they have um, a week to, to work on their art. And then as a school, we come out and we do a chalk walk around the building to be able to see everyone's artwork. And then on the athletic side, we do a annual, that's supposed to be the third annual Clear Lake kickball tournament. We do selection Monday, there's seating, 
Um, there's a bracket, and it just gets everyone so hyped up. It builds such great classroom community. It's another way as well. Our teachers on like second recess are going out even now teaching, especially if like your kindergarten or first grade and you haven't had a lot of chance to maybe play kickball, they're out there with their kids, they're teaching them, they're playing with them because also for the kickball tournament, the teachers are the pitchers, so they're actively engaged in the game as well. And of course there's trophies. So there's an upper um, trophy and a lower trophy for the overall champion. And the classroom gets to hold on to the trophy until the um, next school year. So those are just some of the amazing things that are going on. Um, and it's a really exciting school year already. And I can't wait to come back next fall and update you again.
Thanks, Jeff. Uh, again, it's been my pleasure to be here. It's been a few years now I've been in front of you and getting a chance to share these wonderful audit results with the community and the board. Um, our audit is, is pretty overwhelming with the amount of work we have to do and the amount the finance department has to prepare for us. There's a list of all the things generally we do with an audit, plus a lot more. You know, things like testing, testing uh, policies, testing procedures, going through sampling. Uh, we compare you to other districts, too. How do you compare? Districts are generally pretty the same, pretty close together and similar. We test receipts from general fund. We test a lot of the grain stuff. We test bond spending, um, disbursements, state compliance, federal compliance, all this stuff. And at the end of all of that, it's this paragraph, in your opinion, that matters the most. And it says the, the financial statements as they're presented are free from material misstatement. That's what we call a clean opinion. So congratulations, you passed. <laughs> Part of that reporting we do also includes some, um, some communication to the board. Uh, and one of those things that we identified that could use some improvement are preparation of bank reconciliations, making sure those are more timely, as well as uh, Preparedness on a monthly close and an annual close being prepared uh, and, and getting getting things done with a better process. I know a lot of things are already in the works and, and Connie already shared with me some things they've already implemented since we left the field. There were no significant deficiencies, no question costs, and you and every other district in the state of Michigan has this last comment, which is your food service fund balance is too high. So continue spending down food service fund balance in accordance with the state plan. You've got one on record. We'll just need to continue working that plan to make sure that fund balance gets low. We'll get to the fund numbers here real quick. Um, the general fund is our general operations. That's where we do all of our education from. Uh, total assets was about 37 million. Snapshot as of June, remember. Uh, most of that is from due from other governmental units. That's July and August state aid that we haven't received yet, as well as those reimbursement grants, Title I special ed, that we're waiting for money for. Liabilities, uh, total of about 20 million, that's our contract payroll for July and August, as well as some, uh, some other payroll related items and just our general accounts payable that we need to pay. Our fund balance, our net worth, if you want to call it that, total about 17.2 million, that's that top number, but some of that's already spoken for. Things like non-spendable prepaid items, uh, uh, education solutions, assigned for athletics, assigned for future health care costs. That leaves about $11 million of fund balance that is obligated to pay long-term debt. Uh, percentage, we measure fiscal health of fund balance as a percentage of expenditures or an expenditure uh, percentage of unrestricted revenues. That's really in line with districts your size, about 20% on the, on the revenue side. Um, total revenues of the general fund was about 107 million. We spent 106 million. That left a change in fund balance of about 300,000, going from 16.8 last year to that 17.2 this year. We look at budgets as well, make sure that the board is approving budgets. That's your spending plan, that's how you spend. We budgeted uh, originally back in June before we knew student counts and what our state aid allowance was going to be a zero net. We amended that budget during the year to add 500,000 fund balance. We ended up only adding 332,000. That is pretty darn close. So well done budgeting on that. Uh, where we get our revenues from, remember proposal A, right? Mm -hmm. Foundation allowance times FTE gives us uh, an amount of state aid we're going to get, but we're going to take the local revenue that you collect from your, from your 18 mil off. So in total, the state plus the local added up to about 89% of your funding is from the state of Michigan. Really dependent on the state of Michigan, which is why we continue to advocate increases in our foundation lines. How we spend that money, uh, this is one way to look at it. Instruction and supporting services. Instruction is that in classroom teachers, in classroom management. Uh, supporting services, everything else all the assistance, all the help they get to manage the classrooms and work. When we look at salaries, it's about 85% of 
is salaries and benefits that we spend. Um, we're a people business. We employ people to teach our kids. Just over the uh, trend over the last five years, uh, blue line, blue column being the revenues, green column is the expenditures. When green ex exceeds the blue, we're in a loss situation. ESSER has now officially run out. We've used all our ESSER dollars. Um, and so the next couple of years, there's this cliff of that ESSER cliff we talked about. Um, district's done pretty well to manage that. We're working to make sure that we don't hit the cliff when it comes to that and that ESSER. Again, proposal, proposal A, how we get funding, FTEs times students, or times the foundation allowance. Our enrollment trend has been increasing. Our revenues, therefore, have been increasing as well. Foundation allowance also has been increasing. 25, this fiscal year we're currently in, it is flat. The state of Michigan has decided to um, uh, give us money at school districts through grants rather than increasing proposal A. So the finance department has additional uh, grants they have to manage and spend in, in accordance with how MBE wishes you to spend those dollars. All right, we talked about that 85% of our, of our costs go down to salaries and benefits. One of the biggest costs of those benefits is about 48% on every dollar goes to pay for MIPSERS and OPEP. Those are our retirement and health care benefits for our retirees. 48%, um, now that's being subsidized on a cash basis through 147 through the state of Michigan. Real complicated stuff, but essentially our out-of-pocket cost is 31%. Um, just a, we like to keep this in here to make sure you understand that if the state were to take that 147 grant money away, you'd be on the hook for 48% rather than 31. So increase your expenses by 10%. All right, I told you it would be quick. I promised you. It's a lot of information, a lot of things. Happy to answer any questions the board has. And um, thank you. That thank you. I appreciate you coming. Um, in regards to the two, um, what do you call them? I just want to make sure. Weaknesses noted. I know John presented to the finance committee, and it's not in the packet, so I'll get it to the finance or to the board. Just kind of plan to mitigate that. I don't know if John's afraid to. Um, we'll get that up to you guys in terms of how they're going to mitigate yeah, that. I know. It, it should, sorry to interrupt. It should be in your board packet. Yeah, That's part of that. that. The uh, single audit is required to have a corrective action plan for those. Oh, so it's written up exactly what the district has said they were going to do to fix it. And we were talking this afternoon, uh, and those have already been put into place. Yeah, and I do want to recognize and thank um, the, the accounting department because I recognize they changed the Skyward program in the middle of the last fiscal year, and then our business services uh, superintendent also changed. So a couple um, oh, major hiccups in, in financing. Obviously, John has really stepped up in his role, and, and, and Connie and Courtney have done fantastic. So, yeah. I appreciate all their hard work and everyone in the department. Okay. I have a question. Um, I know John already talked to you about this, so I don't want to get too in the weeds of it. But when it comes to the revolving fund, and you were talking about comparing us to other districts, uh, can you just give us an idea of where we sit compared the to the school bond revolving loan fund? Yes, we're about 10 million. Yeah, um, which is it's a little more than 10 million, I believe, but regardless, it, it, again, what the, the school bond loan fund does, and I'll simplify this as best as possible, is we went out for bonds, right? In order to pay those bonds, we need to make them a 40-year bond instead of a 30-year bond. So the state of Michigan allows us to borrow money to make bond payments where we don't have enough revenue to make those, to extend that bond to the 40th year, something like that. So. Comparably, how do you think we're sitting with that to other districts? In the amount you borrowed on the school bond yeah. loan, uh, it's in the top 10% for sure. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And you mentioned the food service. That was one of um, my questions. You said that most districts are, are facing that, you know, the overspend, you know, need to spend. Yeah, need to spend. Yeah. So do you think how you know how are we comparing in that aspect as well? Have you looked at our spend down plan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and there's a lot of complications that come with the approval of that spend down plan from the state. I would say all but three districts I work with, and we work with about 80 of them, have that commented. 
So it's very common in the state of Michigan. Really what happened there was through all those extra COVID dollars um, during COVID that accumulated this fund balance. And those are federal dollars in there. So we can only spend them in a certain way for meals, for, for equipment, for things like that. We have to have a specific plan to do that. And if we can't get the equipment, Right? I can't just buy lobster and steak days. That doesn't work. We've tried that. But we have to come up with a plan, and we do have a plan, and, and that's in place and should be executed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's my turn. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jacob. I appreciate you, and I definitely appreciate our business team. We have a top-notch team, so thank you so much for all your work. Um, let's see here. So, the first thing I want to get into right away, I know how emotional the last four or five days have been for so many people. Um, I appreciate all the emails, the conversations that people have had with me. It has been distressing, to say the least, regarding the lockdown last Thursday at the high school. Um, many people had traumatic responses to that situation, and I know that because when they were talking with me about their experience, it was really hard for me to differentiate if they were talking about Thursday or if they were talking about their experience on November 30th, right? It just, it conflated. It was, it was very difficult for many, many people. And I just want to express again how sorry I am that that happened. Um, it just broke my heart to see so many people um, experience that. So I just wanted to put that out front. Um, we are being extremely reflective regarding the lockdown, so what I'm going to do is, well, for myself, and Allison is going to speak about it here in a little bit in more detail on certain aspects that we definitely need to strengthen, but I want to go through um, each of the aspects. Um, I call it a plus delta, so what are some things that went well, and what are some things that, that we definitely know we need to change and improve upon. So um, I want to talk about the positive first, and I do want to emphasize how amazing the staff and students did at the high school. They did exactly what they were instructed to do. They did exactly what they knew was in the best interest of student safety. So I'm incredibly proud of what they did. Now, there are a lot of uh, ancillary things that need to be improved, but I definitely want to highlight staff and students first and foremost. Um, uh, especially the safety staff, uh, they worked really hard to, it, it was kind of a, um, a different situation, and I'll get to that in just a second, but the safety staff worked really hard to ensure that students got to locations that they were safe in, were locked in, um, and it was a little tricky, so I'll talk about that here. Uh, they locked down quickly. We're talking within less than a minute, um, we did have some challenges in our lunchroom, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but for the most part, the classes were on lockdown in a very short period of time. Protocols were followed, as I mentioned. Um, collaboration with Sheriff's Department and the um, high school team. And um, again, that was, that was a different scenario. So we'll go through the timeline here in just a section, second, and I'll explain to you why it was so different last Thursday. District personnel arrived to support, so I want to thank everyone in the room. Everyone stepped up and came in to help wherever they could. Um, some of them uh, got over to the reunification site as quickly as possible, as soon as they were notified of the situation. And so I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, announcements were, and this is from, and this was from a parent's email. Um, announcements were clear, direct, and calm. So they very much appreciate the calm voice um, on the PA, uh, which was Anita uh, Conja Collins, um, as well as the district communication that went out 
regularly. Um, so Christine, thank you for um, being on top of that. Appreciate that. Uh, we did release students early. That was very much appreciated. They, of course, were very uh, shaken up, as well as the staff. So that was a big deal. Um, communication, multiple messages. Counselors, the counselors themselves released really staff and students from lockdown. So they saw a friendly face come to the door because they have to be released door by door, right? It's not just an en masse, okay, we're good, you can release. They have to physically be released. And so the counselors um, and the uh, staff, uh, the counselors released the staff and students from lockdown. Um, a lot of people really appreciated the video messaging that was sent out. It was a little tricky because it was a very long day, so it took quite a few takes to get that. But I, I just, I felt in my heart it was the right thing to do in that, you know, it, it's helpful to see someone's face sharing a message. So I'm glad it was well received. So things that we really need to focus on and improving, and we're already working towards many of these. So the use of the PA versus the mass notification system. The PA is what the high school is used to using for doing morning announcements. We do have a mass notification system, but it is not fully functional, and I'll tell you why. So last year we had a false alarm in the middle school um, it really triggered people. And so there has, it was scaled back. Its functionality was scaled back. It no longer was connected to the um, automated messaging. The, they have um, uh, flashy lights that go on. It should have turned those off. So people really hesitate to use that. Um, so we're gonna definitely start moving back because it is a fantastic it really is. I used it in my previous location. Um, it has its own uh, walkie, not really walkie, an announcer, handheld, um, and the speakers are very powerful. So you hear the message more clearly than the PA. You would hear it in the gym. You would hear it in the cafeteria. You would hear it, you know, very, very clearly across the campus. It's just that they were not, it was not fully functional and they were not practiced in using it because they really pulled back last year um, because of that event. So we're gonna work on, on moving forward. We actually met with the company today. We went through a training at the high school on how, what we need to do to get the mass notification up and running, um, where the way that it's fully functional um, and making sure that one, the staff is trained on using it, and two, that we are practicing. This, unfortunately, I want to say it will never happen again. That's not realistic. So we need to practice enough so that it is not such a triggering event. The goal is to keep people safe. It's not to traumatize people. And so we need to get in the habit of, of practicing. So. Uh, we met with Kevin and Carl, and they do our um, safety managing at the buildings um, with Summit today, and we talked through ways in which we can make sure staff and students are practicing on a regular basis, even though it's not required by the state of Michigan. For us, people need to go in auto mode, like auto mode, like I see the flashing lights, I hear the message, I know I need to do X, Y, and Z, right? So that's, that's the ultimate goal. Um, organized movement, our, our biggest issue in the building were the students that were in lunch. And as I mentioned, we used the PA instead of the mass notification, and so you could not hear it very well. So the administration went down and, and physically guided students to locations. Um, gym, library, someone in the back of the, the cafeteria with the cafeteria staff. Um, some ended up in the coach's office, which was not ideal. There was like 70 some odd kids. That's a large office, mind you. It's not, it's not like a small office, but um, that was problematic because the PA system, there's not a PA in there, so they were not hearing the announcements. So that was problematic. And so we need to focus on, you know, students having a clear understanding when they're at lunch and the lockdown signal comes, they know exactly where to go and what to do, right? They got there pretty quickly, they went into the gym, they did everything they needed to do. 
It's just, it, it looked more chaotic than it needs to. So um, we're definitely working on that. Um, lockdown versus Alice protocol, again, everyone did everything they needed to do. Um, I know that the kids were concerned that they were gonna get in trouble because they evacuated. That is their option, right? It's part of the Alice protocol. And so you'll see a video that I did for the students here just a little bit that I emphasize that. So um, when we lock down, you are essentially in a room that is secure from the rest of the, you know, you can't get in, it's locked. Then you have a night lock in it. However, if students feel that their best option is to evacuate, they have that option, right? They have the opportunity to evacuate. Now, where we ran into some challenges is that the group that evacuated did so, they went into the gym from the lunchroom and they left out of the back of the gym, right? And I don't know if you know the high school very well, but it's a very secluded area and they left unbeknownst to the adults in the building. And now we were notified relatively quickly that they had evacuated and we mobilized people to Meyer, but that gap in time created some chaos at, the, at Meyer. Let me say this, Meyer did fabulous. I went over there and talked to the managers and just thanked them wholeheartedly for taking such great care of our kids. They really did a fantastic job. Our goal is to have our staff there as quickly as possible. And we have some strategies in mind to make sure that that happens. Um, communication timing, here's what I'm just gonna show. Allison's uh, is gonna go into a, a more detailed timeline, but I just wanna kinda show you what the timeline looks like. So um, the, lot, the, the sheriff's department arrived at about 11.50 en masse. So they had received information about a potential threat. It was not called into the school. It was not, the school was not notified. The sheriff's department was notified. They came in at 11.50 and said, put the school on lockdown. So as soon as that happens, when the police come, especially in a large group, it is now a police situation. And that makes it a little tricky just because we have our school operations and they have their police op operations. And sometimes they butt heads a little bit, not intentionally, it just becomes a, a little tricky. Um, so the lockdown was called at 11.50. Um, messaging to staff, right? So when we got information from the sheriff's department, messages went out to staff directly via a protocol that they use in the school that there was no imminent threat. Prior to that, we cannot communicate, because it's a police situation, we cannot communicate until we're given quote unquote permission to do so, right? Because they're doing their actions and we have to get information from them. Um, we did a PA announcement at 12.08. Um, Anita went on and started making those PA announcements and she continued with those PA announcements. Again, the PA is challenging because it's not great in some locations. So some people were not receiving those announcements and that's a communication gap that we had. And then we started direct messaging with the information that we had received at 12.11. Now, 19 minutes still is, is not terrible, right? 19 minutes is pretty good, but when you're sitting there not knowing what is happening with your child, it feels like forever. And so our objective is to reduce that significantly. So as soon as we get information, we may not have all of the information, but we knew that the high school was on lockdown. We did not know the reason because the message did not come to us. It came to the sheriff's department. So literally the only thing we could have said was it's on lockdown, but that's still helpful, right? It's on lockdown. We can mobilize district staff at that time to go to the reunification location. Um, my goal is to get that down significantly. My hope would be anywhere between five, um, eight minutes tops. But again, a lot of that has to do with the back and forth communication between the entities that are involved. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the reunification process and protocols, once they got in place, it went better, right? Everybody got home safely. 
um, because Allison's going to talk more about that. But we know we have to tighten that up and make sure that that is clear. Everybody understands their roles. Students understand what they what they need to do. Um, we did have some students decide to go to lunch instead. I think they were at Culver's or wherever. No, they need to go to the reunification. <laughs> um, uh, I also had some information uh, some from the students that they the sheriffs were knocking on the doors. Um, I think they were just checking to make sure as far as location, like was there anything, any imminent threat, or I mean it's their job to clear the area and make sure everything's safe. The challenge with that is that we had students locked down in those rooms and it created additional trauma for them. And so again, it's just it's just working on communication. Um, the sheriff's department has a very specific objective when they come in. They are looking for any threat that might be present, right? So they're solely focused on that. They are not focusing on necessarily the mental health of people or any of those um, additional pieces. It's really about is there a threat? Let's make sure that there's no threat. And if we have to, we need to eliminate that threat. Our focus, obviously, is, is that, as well as the well-being of our students and staff. And that's where it just becomes a, more of a dialogue. We need to have more dialogue. Let's put it that way, right? So again, plus Delta, um, I'm, I'm just our staff and students are just amazing. And I'm so proud of them. They went through so much. And their families went through so much. Um, they're incredible. I've been at the high school the last couple of days. They're incredibly resilient. I got to welcome them to school today, and of course, I had candy for them, and they just were so cute. A big smile, well, not all of them, but most of them were smiling, and, and they're just so resilient. I think we underestimate how resilient our kids are, um, and, and they're just, they just did a great job. I am going to share this with you, and the reason I'm going to share this with you, this was our prepare team worked with our staff and students to come back yesterday. Um, the students had an opportunity to fill out a, um, a survey on a QR code, um, just to check in if they, if they wanted to, it was optional, and we had about 800 students check in to say how they were. Um, we, they could ask for immediate assistance if they wanted it. Uh, we had about eight students request immediate assistance, which they received, and then we had a little over 40 students ask for support sometime this week. And we've already gotten to all of those students to give them that support. So great job to our wellness team at the high school. Um, they really step up and make sure our kids are doing okay. So thank you to them. But based on that survey, some of the kids asked questions. And so the prepared team, <laughs> I don't know what, what it is in the evening. They want me to make videos in the evening. It's not my best time. But at the same time, they thought it would be helpful if the students had me answer their questions um, you know, on a video and um, just in, just reiterate that they did the right thing, that they were okay, they're not in trouble, they did the right thing, answer the question. So I just wanted to show you the video so you see what the students saw today during the advisory. So if you want to click that. Hello, Oxford High School students. It's Dr. Milligan your superintendent, uh, I was asked by the prepare team to respond to some of the questions that came through um, after scanning the QR code today. Um, so I'm gonna do my absolute best to answer those questions. Uh, feel free, after you see this video, to talk to administrators, counselors, FSLs, if you have additional questions or need support. So. The first question uh, was about the timeline last Thursday, and um, the sheriff's department arrived at uh, at the high school at about 11:50. Um, multiple sheriff's cars um, showed up, and at 11:52, we were instructed by the sheriff's department to go on lockdown. So. Once the police step in, it becomes a police situation, and they essentially are directing what is happening because they want to focus primarily on 
safety and making sure there's no threat. So we went on lockdown at 11.52. Um, somebody asked why we use the PA system and not the mass notification system. Um, so the mass notification system has not been fully tested. And so there wasn't the confidence that the message would get through effectively. So the PA was used. We're going to do some additional training on that notification system to make sure everybody knows what it means when it does actually go off. Um, the question about why weren't student, students included in the messaging. So typically we're used to sending out messages to parents and staff. Uh, we failed to send it out to students, so that will be changed in the future. We will make sure that students are included in those um, mass notifications. Um, I also want to say that um, you guys did a great job last week. I know it was incredibly stressful for many, if not most of you. And so um, when we called the lockdown and then lunch, um, you were listening to the directions of the adults. Uh, you can lock down in the gym. There is night locks on the doors as well as shades. Uh, you can lock down in the library. Um, there were some who locked down in the cafeteria area back with uh, the cafeteria staff. Um, essentially, you want to get into any secure location that can be locked. And so everyone did a fantastic job. And some students chose to evacuate. That is always an option if you have enough information to tell you that that is a safer path for you. Um, we are working on our reunification to make sure that we have staff there to help facilitate the reunification and get you connected with your parents as quickly as possible. Um, the other questions, we have, what if we're in the hallway or um, a bathroom or in a courtyard? Again, the goal is to get to the safest, closest place that you can lock. So the bathrooms do have night locks. If you close the door, you can put the night lock in place. That is an option. Any classroom, you go into any classroom. Um, teachers are encouraged to, you know, ensure that kids are in the classroom before they close and lock the doors. Um, and so finding any location whatsoever that the door can be closed and locked and the night lock can be put in place. Um, and what can we do to make sure we stay safe? Follow all protocols. Listen to the instructions from the adults. Uh, including the ALICE protocol. So I know that we've done a lot of training on ALICE. The students did an amazing video on ALICE. We'll be sure to reiterate that and share that again. So that refreshes our memory along the lines of ALICE. And again, those students who exercised that protocol, you did a great job. You were safe. You made a decision for yourself to keep yourself safe. And I am very proud of all of our staff and all of our students um, you guys did a fantastic job in a very stressful situation. And again, I just want to reiterate, um, counselors are available, FSLs, your trusted adults, they're all here to support you. Um, and if you have any additional questions or just need some additional support, please reach out um, to those staff members. So hopefully this answers some or most of your questions. If not, please make sure you're asking additional questions um, regarding last Thursday's situation. So again, I'm very proud of you. Uh, it was a lot and you did a great job. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. Thank you. Mark Suckley um, oversees the prepare team. So um, he had generated that list of questions based on what kids had submitted. And I asked him at the end of the day today, I said, so Mark, did, did that help? Um, did the kids, you know, did they feel like they got their questions answered? And he said, well, most of them said, well, those weren't my questions. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> but they definitely had an adult that they could ask those questions to in the space that they were watching the video. So hopefully 
watching the video, help them think of their questions and communicate and have that dialogue. Okay, so again, Allison will come up and talk some more about specifics like the reunification um, process and the mass notification system. So huge shout out to our Board of Education who um, last Friday provided lunch to all of our schools, with the exception of the high school, because of course they were not in session. Um, our teachers were so appreciative of your efforts. Um, we delivered it, and we tried to deliver it during their lunchtime. That got a little tricky, but um, one of the restaurants, uh, Patouche, I think, um, provided the food, and it was delicious. And they actually came in early to make that food. So thank you so much to them. We provided lunch for the high school yesterday, and cabinet members and other district staff served the teachers during the three lunches. We had a beautiful area, sun was coming in. Um, they had time to come together over a meal, have conversation. Um, they were incredibly appreciative as well. So thank you, board members, appreciate that. Um, Mike had asked at the last meeting, um, as far as a comparison with our school quality data, um, thank you to Pam Beal, she forwarded me a um, comparison uh, survey data. It was a compilation of 30 different school districts. Now, for whatever reason, the company asked some different questions on there, so in some cases it was like apples and oranges, but I did find some comparison data, so I just want to go through that. So again, in Oxford, you can see the numbers of parents, staff, and students that participated. The comparison data that I'm going to show you is based on those numbers, so it's, it's a fairly large data set. So that was over 30? 30 schools. 30 yeah. Well, 30 school districts. So the first one um, that I'm bringing up, and I apologize, it's so small. How, it is looking at the overall school quality um, of, of Oxford, the responses from Oxford compared to uh, the comparison group. So you can see generally from parents and guardians, it's, a, it's very similar. Um, the outcome is very similar. Same thing with staff. Staff was almost exactly the same, with the exception of agree was a little larger than the strongly agree in the comparison group, um, or in the Oxford group group. And then secondary students, you can see that the responses are somewhat significantly different in the disagree or strongly disagree. The Dimension scores, comparison by respondent type. As you just kind of glance down, I know it's a lot and it's really small. I just wanted to provide an opportunity to compare. There was, and Mike asked me, did anything jump out? No, nothing jumped out. And the reason why that's really great is because Oxford has been through so much. And so what we're seeing is that from a recovery standpoint, we're getting to be on par with other school districts. We still have a ways to go. There's still areas that we need to improve and strengthen and support, but we're getting there. So it was good to kind of just see those lined up um, and how they compare. Again, they're not, there's a couple questions. I think there's an additional question on the comparison group than for Oxford. That just gives us some idea. And then when we looked at the highest ranking, um, I kind of had to pull some out. Um, the, it was not an easy comparison, but I did find some data. So from families informed, our results compared to the, the group, oh, sorry. Um, we actually have significantly higher, what I would say it's 6% higher as far as families are informed. It just goes to show, similar to what Stephanie was talking about, making sure that we're communicating and sending out those newsletters into SNORT and making those contacts um, definitely has an impact. School is safe. 
Uh, I found that interesting. So from a staff standpoint, we're about 2% higher than the comparison group. However, from a parents and students, you can see that we're still, there's still quite a gap. There with 10% for parents and 7% for students. So again, over time, as we strengthen a lot of our work, my hope is that we'll see that continue to improve. Aware of safety procedures, right on point, 81 and 81. And then staff members being aware of safety protocols, we were 5% higher than the comparison group. As far as our lowest um, areas, Bullying, ours, and again, this is the lower is better. We're going for a lower number. You have um, a 5% difference between us and the comparison group. So our goal is, is to get that as low as possible, so there's work to be done there. Same thing with discipline enforced fairly. From a parent's perspective, we were right on uh, the same uh, plane as uh, staff, 26 and 26, as well as students. Uh, 29 and 29. And then relating lessons to real life, we were about 2% higher than the comparison group. So just some, some comparison numbers, because I know it is helpful to just kind of see what we look like uh, if compared to other school districts. I just want to touch base on that. Okay, and as Mike pointed out, he sent us this picture. We do indeed have, are starting to have a parking lot at OEIC. They actually started paving today, so that has been uh, a long process. Now we don't have a roof yet, but we've got a parking lot, so one step at a time. Um, we're going to play Where's Dr. Milligan? You never know where I'm going to show up. I think the last presentation I did, I came out of a bus. This time I came out of a uh, fire truck, which was really cool. So Kelly Kilgore was my driver. He's also our uh, EMT instructor at the high school. He did a great job. The kids love the honking of the horn. That was really fun at the homecoming um, parade. Um, I got to go to Leonard last Friday. Uh, that is actually my neighbor, Melissa Musgrove. Um, and that is Moon Pie. That's my neighbor dog. It's like my actual neighbor, like my next door neighbor. Um, and so she texted me because she knew, probably having a, a challenging day last Friday. She was like, hey, just reaching out, saying hi, Moon Pie's here. And I'm like, I'll be there. <laughs> so the added bonus of getting to see Melissa and uh, Moon Pie was that they were also having their pep assembly. So the fun thing about it, it was just, it was so positive and so energetic kids were awesome. So the teachers had, had uh, created pumpkins. I don't know if you saw this picture. I think um, it was sent out in, the, in a, a, another message. So the teachers create these pumpkins, and then the kids can put in for the raffle to win the pumpkins. So I had gone out to recess, and I was hanging out with uh, a teacher. I was talking with a teacher, and a little girl came up to me, and she was talking to the teacher, and she was just she wanted this pumpkin so bad. She wanted the wildcat pumpkin. Like, I just have to have it. And I thought, oh my gosh, if she doesn't get this pumpkin, I'm gonna be so upset. That's Lily winning the pumpkin. It made me so happy. So after a really rough several days, being with the kids and feeling their energy and the positivity of the event. So thank you, Paul, that was a great event. Um, staff and students, it was it was wonderful. <clears throat> now, here's some awesome news. So Wildcats rise uh, on Thursday, the day that the lockdown happened, and it was very stressful. The boys soccer team, they chose, they had a choice. They did not need to participate if they were not comfortable. All of them chose to go to the soccer competition and they are now our regional champs. So pretty exciting and they're going to um, semifinals in states tomorrow night in East Lansing. So congratulations to our boys soccer team. I think they're being celebrated right now um, at the park, Centennial Park. They have um, a kind of a <coughs> assembly for them as well as several other groups including well, this was from last night, so Katie Pill went to uh, States and placed 44th place. And if you can imagine, this is the entire
their state, all the young ladies in the state, 44th is really good. Um, and she is just a hoot. She is just an amazing young lady. So congratulations, Katie. Um, cross country boys also qualifying for states. So they're being celebrated tonight as well. And then uh, Mallory and Taylor, two of our girls cross country, they're going to states as well. And I think that's my last Wildcats ride. So last week was tough, but our, as I told you, our kids are resilient. And you can see the, the, they were just focused on getting to the business of winning, and they did. So pretty excited and very proud. Opening it up for questions. Okay, thank you for the presentation. The football team, too, that's downtown tonight, actually. Oh, the football team, yeah. Because yeah. they are, James, I'm sure. That's right. OAA Red Champs. Yes. And you can raise the playoffs. Yes. Which is Friday at Davidson. Great. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Matt, I do have some. Um, some of these. But in the <coughs> after action report, you mentioned OCSO didn't notify, well, it looks, seems like they didn't notify OHS until they were there present. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Is that, correct? Is that normal protocol? Um, I think Allison will speak to that um, at a more eloquently. Um, in my experience, it is not. Typically, I'm the one that calls the lockdown. Um, I have never had you police, the superintendent me, or the me principal. being the principal. Okay. So when I was a high school principal, I was responsible for that. So I would receive the information, or police may come and give me information, and then I would call the lockdown. This was a different situation. And again, there's a, there could be a variety of reasons. I think some of the, the situation, again, people, um, experienced November 30th, and it impacts what they do when we do lockdowns. And so that could have been a part, because many of the sheriff's department, um, it was the same individuals who responded on that day. I can't okay. say for sure. And this probably came from your county today, so this, but I'm curious of what time that they were dispatched, like what that timeline was yeah. like leading up to it. Um, and this might be something else we can try to figure. Um, but do timelines reintroduce or introduce the mass notification system? Like, do we have a timeline? Yeah. Um, Allison was in the meeting today. Um, so we do have a timeline. We're going <clears> to <throat> start. Um, we met with the company today. We're going to get some bids on, because it, it, it's a bigger thing. So at the high school, we have the mass unification or the mass notification, and we have the fire separate, and those systems really should be integrated, and so we're working to put that together. But the mass notification, we're going to um, have the uh, voice reactivated. We're going to ensure that it's it's labeled um, accurately, and that because it comes with a yellow flashing light. So right now, the kids wouldn't know what that would mean, right? We haven't used it. So we're going to get those two things situated. They're not challenging to get situated. However, the biggest thing is we have to practice. We cannot just use it just point blank. and Nobody's had a chance to know what it is. So one of the things we talked about in our meeting today was doing a video that could be introduced in advisory. Like, this is what you're going to see. This is what you're going to hear. Here are the steps that you'll take. There should be no surprises. If they should know, like the back of their hand, when they see the yellow light, when they hear the words, they know exactly what's happening, um, and they're able to follow the procedure. So our goal is, is within two weeks to have a practice, that those things are working, and we have a practice round with that. And now, uh, do we know, is the mass notification system side of things, is that currently able to be heard clearly in all areas? Can you say um, the, the mass notification system side of things, is that 
it will be heard clearly throughout your school in yeah. all areas that we saw that we had yeah. to we did look at the, the um, kitchen area, so the kitchen area because you have you have ventilation, you have cooking, you have kids in the cafeteria. Um, we felt that there needs to be additional speakers in there, so we all went in there today with the company, and they're looking at installing additional speakers in there. Okay, <laughs> like all all the rooms, yeah. right? Because even like little closets, as we saw, right? It seems like. Uh, especially the cafeteria being or some areas where large groups of students are congregating, mm -hmm. there's going to be at least a percentage of them potentially going and just finding a spot, right? From a PA standpoint, is that what you're saying? That they're right. here? Yeah. yeah. We need to make sure that they can hear wherever they end up. Yeah. If they can lock themselves in 12 the units, they can't really. But wherever they end up, they can hear it. Yeah, so the mass notification system, the PA that's associated with that is extremely powerful. And this is how I know. So when I was a high school principal, um, when kids were not listening to my announcements, I would use, the, it's, just a, it's just a walkie essentially, I wouldn't actually like trigger the, the alarm or anything. I would use it to communicate because it was so powerful and they were like, ah, you know, it would kind of get their attention. So it's powerful, there are speakers, and it actually goes through the fire system and uses the speakers that are associated with that um, to blast out the message. There's even speakers, um, we were talking about it today, that can go on the outside of the building so that if it's after school, the athletes can hear it. Um, and so we're working on getting that established as well. And again, Allison's going to give greater detail. She obviously is, is in the mix a lot more than I am, but um, you know, there there are definitely room. There's definitely room for improvement. I can wait for Allison if you want, um, mm -hmm. but that just maybe it's something in my mind where I, I'm now more confused. Mm -hmm. What exactly are we getting bids on? Are we replacing what's existing? Are we going to the company from our other building? Yeah. So we have. Three buildings where they're separate units, fire unit and a mass notification unit. That's not a very efficient way, because a mass notification can do everything. Can do fire, can do a shelter in place, can do everything. And have multiple units to do multiple things becomes really confusion, confusing. Not to mention the fact that a mass notification, the way that we have it um, now, you can tailor it to your building's um, emergency protocols. So you can have, this is a practice shelter in place. You know, this is a release from shelter in place. You can go through all of the way that we uh, term it. You can tailor it to exactly what we need. Right now, it's, it's just a couple of buttons. There's very few options. The other thing that we're looking at doing um, is there are uh, 10 swipe areas in the high school where teachers can use their ID badges. It's, it's not functional right now, but we're going to work with the district safety team and determine if it would be a good tool to use. There's 10 different lake locations in the school that if a staff member takes their badge and puts it up next to the swiper, it automatically um, connects to emergency response and triggers a, um, an alert to go throughout the building. So that's just additional locations where that alert, that drill can be activated. <coughs> so hopefully okay, the now are companies? Same company. Same company right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Allison, if I'm, I'm misspeaking, make sure you correct me. She she is in the know. So when you present, just maybe okay. talk to it better than I did. Okay. Can I interrupt you for one minute? Just piggybacking on what you just said so tell me say again what you just said <coughs> about the swipers yes so yeah so the swipers would then would activate, would activate it for the whole bill mm -hmm. okay the other two that i had just on your presentation uh since we were talking about parking lot can you give us an update on ons the, the appliances that we have purchased are they there are they Functional. How is that? For the kitchen. Yes. Is that what you're talking about, John? Oh, I know we're 
we're getting close. We're still waiting on state, right? You're talking about the middle school? Or the middle school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I need to touch base with Betty to see what the state of conclusion is done. The last time I talked to her, it's probably been a couple weeks now since I talked about it. Some stuff was in, some of the equipment was coming in still. So that's hopefully it's all in place by at this point, but I can confirm, confirm it. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had a question on the survey. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, you said you compared various schools, and I just wanted to say, were they all Michigan? Were the demographics similar? Uh, were they open county? Do you know how that was spread out or chosen? Um, I'll have to look. I'll, I'll pull it up. No, I'll give it to you. Thanks. Um, I don't think it was all Michigan, and they had urban, they had rural, they had suburban. Um, I know that for a fact. I just don't know if it's all Michigan or not. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? One question. So, in regards to the response from OCS, I don't know if there's clarity by chances for Oxford and Fire. Mm -hmm. Do we know if they were aware, were they, were they notified that OCS was in the route? Like, do we know that? I do not know that. Allison might have that information. So, let's go back. All right, item number seven on the agenda. We had a field trip for Boys Varsity Basketball that came to the last meeting. Uh, if you're ready to make a motion, I'll take that now. Connie? Sure. Uh, move to approve the OHS Boys Basketball Field Trip request to Missouri, Michigan, November 14th and 15th, 2024, as presented. Do I have support? James? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. In addition, there's two other um, trips for you to review in the packet. And you can talk about the yeah. yeah, the two baseball trips. Um, one is to Kalamazoo Central High School on the new Derek Jeter Field for April 19th. Um, and then the other one is for the baseball team to the annual spring training to Clearwater, Florida. Item B on the agenda is the OCSBA proposed bylaws change. It was sent out um, for the change in their bylaws, which was in green. It was just one little change. Mm -hmm. So um, I will take a motion for that. Amanda? Move to approve the proposed amendment to the OCSBA bylaws as presented. Do I have support? Colleen? Sure. Support. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, I can see it is a committee uh, updates, policy committee. So we are bringing the policies listed for approval as a second reading. Uh, we discussed last time the change to the visitors and volunteers, which is lined as a point of one. The other ones, as you can see, are all recommendations from True. We didn't change any except for uh, 5305. We are proposing that that be a point of one because of one of the items in True's recommendations is a process that we do not do here in Oxford. Uh, it's talking about school of choice and it gets into the board applying a random draw lottery, which is something that we do not do here. So we removed that true and approved language, and the rest are pretty straightforward. Okay. Can I get a motion? Callie? Okay. Move to adopt board policies 3505.01. No, 310. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Three one, right? Mm -hmm. Zero five point zero one. Mm -hmm. Five two zero eight. Five three zero five point zero one. Five three zero six. Five five zero nine. 
5701 and 5804 as presented. And James? Yeah. And any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number two under committee updates is our governance committee. Any of those? No, governance committee first. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we also had a governance committee meeting that was very successful, went very well. Uh, we are continuing our work on the board operating procedures. So we put in the language for board goals and responsibilities. Um, we referenced current policies to all of our proposed changes. Um, we added sections for public participation expectations of board members as well as community members, standards of behavior for board members, how we communicate not only to ourselves, to staff, to media, um, you know, expectations along those lines, conflict resolution, should that come up between board members? And so we're, we're pretty close to that connect. We sent to Tanya and asked her to get with her admin to discuss a, a good layout. We proposed the yearly things that we would like to see on the agendas and they at our next governance meeting will have answers so that we can finalize that document and finish our work on getting um, guidelines and manuals in place for new board members. Anything to add? No. Great job. Okay. Any questions? That's great work. Yeah. A lot of work. Great. We're hoping to have a draft to you guys in November so that way you can get approved before the last board meeting of the year and then um, we'll be in a place for January when we move forward. So. All right. Item D under uh, board business is a fee appeal FOIA dated 10 3 24. This is just uh, the question of to charge or not to charge if someone has an idea on how they want to proceed with the motion. I move to grant the fee appeal for the FOIA dated 10 3 2024. Do I have support? No support. Any discussion? There is some redacting on this one, just so you guys are aware in terms of um, the fee that was associated with it. It's just not a blank document that was findable, and I think the fee was for 15 minutes. So, um, just making sure. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Opposed. Aye. 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 Summers, no. Whitney? Yes. Hatchison? No. <coughs> uh, McDonald? Yes. Reese? Yes. Motion carried. All right. Yep. He did that. I don't know. Two. Three. So yep. motion doesn't carry. Um, so we have to do an extra motion. It was a 4 3. Oh, it is 4 3. Okay. 4 3. Okay. 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 Motion carries. Yeah. All right. Sounds great. All right. Number eight uh, on the agenda is finance and operations. The annual summer tax resolution was presented at the last meeting, so I'll just take a motion to adopt it. Uh, Amanda? Move to adopt the annual summer tax resolution as presented. Do you have support? Mike Alter? Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. Item 9, School Safety Operations. Dr. Willowin, Safety Update.
we're going to start with what I was originally scheduled to present on tonight, which was a little bit about uh, our quarterly safety update, and then we'll go into Thursday's event. So first, I wanted to talk about the Parent Safety Advisory Board. We do have those names to bring to you. Um, what we did when we asked for applications is we did open it up across the district, but we're really focusing on those campuses that we did not have any representation for. Um, and part of the application that went out, it was that they will review aspects of our comprehensive multi-hazard safety department and be able to provide feedback to review training opportunities available to the community and provide feedback to review policy and or state guidelines and then other duties as suggested. Um, and this mirrors the criteria and the way that we did this mirrors exactly what we did for the, the sex ed advisory board. Um, so part of what we did this time was we took the applicants and brought them to the policy committee, exactly how we did for uh, the other board that was selected. And so with this, um, we really wanted to focus on a diversity of opinions, experiences, and perspectives, and focusing again on a representation of fields such as safety, security, mental health, and medical professionals. Because what we want as part of this group is people who can wear both hats, who are able to help because our, our department, there's no way I can know how to do water management and everything. And there's so many things within multi-hazard safety and security. Um, we wanted to really focus on people who could bring that expertise, who could be a nurse and a parent and wear both hats. Because the difference with our district safety committee is when you are there as a representative of your job, whether it be as an Oxford Community Schools employee or as a fire chief or a police chief, you're there wearing your police chief hat. Um, you can interject some parent things, but your expertise is that. Where we wanted this group to really focus on being able to lend that expertise while also talking through what things look like as a parent. And when we talked during our my last presentation, we went through the communications. It was what does that look like from your perspective, whether it's you're in firefighting or a lawyer or we have a school administrator whose dissertation focused on school safety and how do you receive that as a parent. So it, it was really trying to look for people that were going to enhance the multi-hazard safety department that we have. Um, we wanted representation from each school and have assets, background, past experiences, and useful knowledge of multi-hazard safety. And as you can see, it's a graphic, but there's all sorts of things that go into an emergency operation plan that are on a daily basis, things that we have to think about. Um, and, and we use things like the FEMA hazard index to help us know like what natural disasters are in this area. We don't tend to have to plan for hurricanes here, for example. Um, but really being able to take that information and when we think of things even like snow days and how many dirt roads we have, being able to talk through that with parents who also have that safety and security background is helpful. Um, so we had 18 applicants for approximately seven spots. We wanted to keep it between 12 to 15 just because we don't want a committee that's too big, but we want to have representation. Um, and so what we ended up with was we have and this is cumulative. So when you see five from Oxford High School, that doesn't mean five individuals from Oxford High School, six individuals from Oxford Middle School. It means you could have one parent that has a child at DA, OES, the middle school and the high school. But we wanted to, to just show the, the representation across. We did not receive any applications from Lakeville, Bridges, or OVA. So that is why those remain at zero. Um, but as you can see across the board, the other campuses on the left-hand side, we were able to get parent, um, parent representation from. And so within that, our subject matter expertise on this, compute, on this committee, it, as you, it's extensive, but it ranges from communication to nursing to, a, like I said earlier, there's a school administrator, we have a school psychologist, so being able to talk through mental health, um, special education, um, water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure, which we have a drinking water management plan that has to go forth in January 2025. John and I have been working on that with our maintenance team, but again, just having that other voice at the table to be able to help because I can tell you I am not a water, sewer, stormwater infrastructure expert, and unless there's something I don't know, John, I don't know if you are either. So being able to comply with the law, there's a 
22 page report we have to fill out and then be able to then tap into a resource I think is going to be a great opportunity for our parents to be able to forward the progress of this district um, and so when we look at something like a parent advisory board there isn't a lot of guidance when it comes to that when you look at the guide for developing high quality school emergency operation plan in page, uh, page six it discusses creating your core planning team but that's really that core planning team is what our district safety committee is and so we do have parents from this advisory board that serve on our district safety committee but then they're able to do it as a parent they don't have to wear both hats they can because they have the subject matter expertise but really being able to use the, the experience and the resources we have in our district to really help us come together and be able to improve what we have and so um, this is the list of our 14 members um, the ones with the asterisk next as you can see they are new for the 2024-2025 school year and they will have they will all meet together as a group on November 21st, where we will be discussing aspects of the EOP. Um, and, and because that earlier that day when we have our district safety committee, we will be discussing the EOP more in depth. Do you have any questions about that group? And I wanna thank the board policy committee for taking part in that discussion and really talking through what will be able to enhance and support my department as well, which then in turn supports our staff and our students and really being willing to, to have a longer <coughs> meeting to really get to what's going to be, as Dr. Milligan said, a value add for this group. Um, because at the ones without the asterisk next to their name, they've been here either last year when they joined or at the beginning of the, the committee. So being able to honor those who have already been on the committee as well as the new addition. The next item is um, the suicide risk assessment update for August and September. As you can see, we have had six screeners and eight full suicide risk assessments as of the end of September. Um, we had seven that were low risk and one that was high risk. Next is our threat assessment report for August and September. We had a total of 28 with nine full threat assessments and 19 screeners. Eight were listed at a minimal priority, one moderate priority. And finally, our bullying investigations for August and September. We had a total of three, one at Leonard, two at Oxford High School. All were found to be not bullying. Any questions on those three pieces of data? Okay, so now we're going to get into the timeline. Um, it is a rather condensed timeline. We wanted to really focus on the response. Um, at 11.44 a.m., the Oxford, um, Oakland, sorry, no, uh, Oakland County, sorry, there, Oakland County Sheriff's Office was notified of a call for a male alleged to be in Oxford High School with a pipe bomb and an AR-15 in a bathroom. At 11.50, um, the Sheriff's Office arrives at the high school to meet with Deputy Grafalski. He, at 11.51, he informs me that we need to place the school in lockdown. Um, 11.51, 11.52, the school is placed in lockdown. Um, district and school level ICS charts are activated, which means your command staff, your section chiefs are notified of what the Oakland County Sheriff's Office received a threat on. Um, at 12.03, Mike, it's not on here, but to answer your question, because I checked my phone, I talked to Chief Majestic, um, where we started planning, do we need to stage? And then he did stage in the south parking lot. Once we were at Meyer, we deemed that we didn't need to have anyone there, we didn't, but we did ask, and he was ready to do that and deploy that if we needed it. Um, at 12.06, our staff was updated electronically. At 12.08, there was an announcement to remain in lockdown. And in, at 12.11, a district communication was sent out. During that time, from the time that De 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 Detective Rapolsky was notified, that is when they began doing a sweep of the bathrooms. And I just want to take this time to thank De Detective Barnes and Detective Rapolsky, uh, Lieutenant Patterson, Sergeant Meza for their quick response, for being able to go into action and do exactly what they needed to do based on the information they have and what their procedures are. 
Um, their communication was very clear with me. Um, as you can see, and I can get down to the seconds on this, I can tell you at 11.50 in some seconds, the sheriff's office arrived at the high school by 11.50, 30 seconds, they were in the security office. The next thing you see on video is Rafalski and Mr. Brooks coming out of the security office to come talk to me um, because I happened to be there at another meeting. Um, so it was very quick action on the part of our, our security team and it, it's very grateful for the team that we have there. We're gonna jump to 135 because for me it felt like a very long time going through that and being able to, to make sure that our kids were safe and our staff were safe. But at 135 that is when the final um, groups of students had finished leaving the building so that the sheriff's office could complete their final sweep to make sure there was no one left in the building and just to be able to then um, do the other police business they have. Um, I do also want to thank Detective Barnes for having the great idea that he did was as we released, being able to take people that our students would know so that we could release them, so that we did have mental health with them, as well as Mr. Rourke, Detective Barnes, Detective Rafalski, myself, and Mr. Brooks going along with mental health staff to be able to help release kids so that there were, from that time, someone checking in on them, a familiar voice, um, I know that there were rooms as I went through and they knew who I was, being able to just see that familiar face. And so that's a, that's a huge credit to Detective Barnes um, and grateful for that quick thinking to be able to, to do that and think about our kids throughout all of that. Because although they're still there as deputies and they're acting in a matter of law enforcement, to take that second to really think about what's gonna help our kids as they exit our building, it just, it, it's great that we have SROs that are always thinking that way. So getting into reunification, because that seems to be a lot of questions that we've gotten. We did start using the standard reunification this year through the I Love You Guys Foundation. Um, we were no I was notified at approximately 11.58 in the morning that students had gone to Meyer, and at by 11.59, um, I had called our district reunification leads to go to Meyer, and by, Time stamps at approximately 12:10, um, they arrived at Meyer to begin setting up. Um, and so, just so we are aware of the standard reunification method, there is a rhyme and reason to everything. And it really, what this does is it is exactly what's in the title. It standardizes how we do that. Are there ways that we can improve? Definitely, because this is the first time we've really had to do it outside of planning on paper, talking about it, making sure we have the memos of understanding. Um, and so even in the, from the I Love You Guys Foundation, this is, a, this is an evolving process. While there is a smattering of science in these methods, there is certainly more art. And so that's where we can then take that back and how to improve, improve on that. We have approximately, um, when they, when our district reunification leads arrived, there were approximately 150 students and 30 to 40 parents present, and parents continued to arrive over the next 10 to 25 minutes. There were about eight to 10 Oxford staff that were providing those emergency cards. Let me go to this card. There are cards that they received. It was decided after talking to our reunification um, leads that there is electronic ways to do these things, but the way that the light was, the way that the internet was working, it was more productive to be able to just go back to paper and confirm that way. Um, because that's been a question that's come out. We have to make decisions in the moment, and that was what worked for the group. Um, and so what will happen is a parent and guardian will come check in. They'll be guided to an area. The students will be guided to an area. Parents will be guided to an area. Attendance will be taken, um, and then we'll, we would notify parents, guardians of the location in an ideal world. We were then almost doing the reverse because students were already there, and as soon as we were notified that students had elected to evacuate as they felt appropriate and safe to do so, um, the setting up period was kind of as we were going. Um, so a greeter will hand a parent a reunification card, and we did have people that were assigned during that time to do so. Um, parent identification is verified. The card is split, there's a perforated area for that, and then the parent and guardian receives the bottom portion. 
Um, then the parent guardian takes their car to what's called the reunifier. The reunifier gets the student, brings them to the parent, and then they, there's a whole order to how that will work. Um, and so at about, um, let's see, in total, we had two students identified early on that they were not going to be able to have transportation. But outside of that, we had approximately, let me, I want to say my math correctly, so hold on. We had, a, we had approximately 249 total students that they elect to evacuate, and all but two we were able to, they had to go home on the bus, so they had to be transported back to school. And I do want to highlight some of the, the unique situations that occurred, whether it was parents worked an hour and a half away, um, had some, some people who are normally able to pick up or had to work on something else, like there were other areas such as illness that they couldn't come pick up their child or um, any sort of disability such as being blind that they weren't able to drive. Um, and so that team was then able to work on how do we get them home, let's talk to that person, let's confirm what we know. Um, and so it is something that we will continue to work on. We do have some district level staff that are very interested in getting the training to just be able to think through that. Um, we do have our district leads right now have gone through training. Dovi's even allowed us to go look at their entire drill that they've done just to be able to be, um, just to have that one next step. But again, it's very hard and difficult until you're in the moment and um, looking at in, in about 15 to 18 minutes being able to get that set up. Uh, again, not a perfect process, but no process is going to be perfect. And that's why I really like that the standard reunification method states that there is a science to it, but there's also an art to being able to get that set up. And so we're just grateful again to Meyer for being to opening their doors to us that our kids knew to go there. Um, yes, we didn't have the Culver's and the Taco Bells and all that stuff, but it was lunchtime. Teenage brain, I'm gonna wanna eat some food too. Um, so we'll just continue to work on that and then we're grateful. I know Pam um, was one of the staff members that wants to get some more training on it. Um, Janet also offered, I believe Courtney did as well, just to be able to be another resource because we can't have too many people train on something like this, especially when it's how we're gonna return our children back to their families. Um, and so it's never going to be easy because it is scary especially in, in this district and just going back like it's not, it's never going to be an easy experience, but we can try and bring some order to it. Um, I do not have any specific slides for the mass notification system because that happened after I had given Kelly my slides for this evening, but one of the things that was decided, it's something John and I kind of inherited, um, was it was decided early on that the high school Clear Lake and Lakeville would keep those separate systems. So now we're going to work on integrating so that they don't have a fire panel and a mass notification so that it becomes one system. Um, part of what we met with Summit with, this was a meeting we had already had on the books for two or three weeks wanting to meet with them because we did want to learn more about it and figure out how we could go back to having some of the voice. Um, not in the same way that it was done at the middle school on the false alarm day, but being able to improve from there. So we did learn today, and I'm excited for this piece, which we're meeting with Sasha and Trevor about tomorrow, that we can record multiple ones. So we'll be able to use all five of the standard pieces of the standard response protocol to have those messages pre-recorded. Things like evacuate, there's very clear language in the standard response protocol, so it's not gonna be up to the adult that's at the system trying to remember what to say. We can record that in, and then we can record in, such as an evacuate, exactly where they need to evacuate to. Uh, and we can get that dependent on if they're going to their primary evacuation place or their secondary evacuation place. Um, and so being able to get that going will be great being able to have that support from Dr. Milligan, from, from John, um, and then Summit really just taking the time to explain little unique things that we're able to do. We do have a couple of other panels in different parts of the building at the middle school and the high school, so being able to add those buttons there as opposed to just being a warning, a warning sign that really won't help anyone if they're in the cafeteria, but being able to press the buttons as appropriate. Um, and so it's always, again, a learning process, and the best thing that we can do is just keep training and moving 
forward. Um, Dr. Sprawl and uh, Mr. Melms in the high school are going to kind of lead that process as far as training staff across the district on that and just making sure everyone feels comfortable with it and get, gets familiar because even if it is just hold, get in your classroom, hold, which is not the exact phrase, so forgive me because I did not write down the exact phrase at this moment. Um, that's a little more comforting than even the message that went out on the, on the false um, alarm day. So we're wanting to make sure we're still adhering to what our procedures and protocols are, but also being mindful of where we are as a community and being able to, to start to move forward on that. And so just that reminder as we go through all of these components and we really rely on prepare workshops one and two and that's part of where the student survey came from and as the prepare team, as that's been mentioned, as they come together, it really is to look at all components of it. It's not just a one, one stop, we're gonna try and prepare and prevent, but it also is what are we doing moving forward. And I think um, Todd Barless and Bridget Bittner and Mark Suckley housed at the high school, being able to get that team together and get things ready to be able to work through the weekend on that, um, it, it really shows the, the teamwork that we have. And although there's a, a lot of different emotions involved in this, at all points throughout this, it was very powerful to see uh, people being able to come together and all of us in various aspects of our life and, and whatever we have experienced, being able to do what was best for our kids and what was, what was best for adults. So I'm grateful for the teams that I'm able to work with that can put that focus first so that we could ensure as quick as possible we were able to get everyone out of the building and home. What questions do you have for me? Thank you, Allison. Go ahead. Yes. And it is a short, it just focused on. Yeah. Uh, the, the first two lines. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying, I'm trying to understand my like, protocol and Certainly, that seems to be on OCSO right there. But there were six minutes between OCSO being notified and, well, first, I guess. That's when they received the call. That's when they received the call. So it was a call on the email? It was a call. Okay, it was a call. And it got relayed to dispatch. <laughs> and then they were sent out to the high school. Now, typically, would there be communication in that six minutes to recall? That is a question you would have to ask the sheriff's office. I don't have as far as like as far as I know we've talked about that before. I know that I know that part's on the sheriff's office. But as far as our discussion in the past, would you have expected a heads up and to sit there wouldn't be a six minute delay? Well, they came in. Like that's I, I can't speak to what their procedures are. That would be a question for the sheriff's office. Okay. Allison? Yes. Just piggybacking on Mike, maybe that's a question for us to ask the sheriff. Like, that that's a long time. Why didn't you call so that we could have had our kids in lockdown? Right? Is that sort of what you're thinking, Mike? Like, yeah. six minutes is a long time. Right. So that might be something we can be proactive and say to the sheriff. Okay, help us understand why this. There's nothing else to call the SRO. Someone is notified. Right. I, we, ask, we know, I, just, we I just don't, don't have, have an answer for that because right. I can tell you we know I was that. one office over meeting with two assistant principals and some students of our really, really great family activity they want to plan for next week. I don't think so any I, of us think you have to. No, no, no. I, I just wasn't in that room to even be able to say this happened or that happened. That's why I'm just referring that we have to ask the sheriff's office. Right. Right. So we'll continue our after action review. Yes. Part of that will be a conversation with the sheriff's department, um, possibly Sheriff Bouchard, possibly um, Sergeant Patterson, um, you know, to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, it's definitely worth a conversation. I'm going to bounce back to the mass on the patients 
system because I, I still feel unclear about this. Uh, from what I know, the timeline is it goes like, you know, we, we approved over a million in 2022 in the mass notification system for all buildings? Is that yes. Right? yes, it's throughout the district. And some of them, you mentioned Clear Lake and over Clear Lake, Lakeville, and um, Oxford High School still has separate fire panels and a mass notification system. So they did not receive the new? They have a mass notification system, okay. but they also have a fire panel. I'm going to step in. I believe Thank you. it was a tech, technology vibration between the panels that are in those buildings and the mass notification because we were asking as board clarification why they can be integrated and it at the time the cost to upgrade the fire and, and I'm trying to remember it's been a couple of days but there was a, a cost an additional cost factor there and we were looking at let's get us up and running and get it going and stuff and because of supply chain there's a bunch of different things but to your point that's why it's separate as well as there was concerns at the time of putting it in the fire panel they do a fire drill and it's sitting with the wrong button and it just there we asked the board and to get clarification on that and that was what we got the time there's just a bunch of stuff so it is separate at those three buildings and and that was as we approved as a board and i appreciate yeah. that john because our james sorry yeah. i'm just going to use the wrong but, Dr. Milligan mislabeled. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be all right. I'll, do, I'll call you the wrong name too. Um, that was prior to my employment. So I'm grateful for that insight because I don't I, I don't know why it didn't happen. But what I do know is today when we had already had a meeting to sit down and discuss that very thing. And that is able to, to happen. So, so now we are moving. We are moving forward. To so if you look behind right. us, there's the alert. That's the other number. Yeah. That is different. And with those panels, if I remember correctly, we wanted those separate, so it wasn't the same as the alarm, fire alarm system, and those panels couldn't do it. And so I had to be a separate, I don't want to say bolt on, because that doesn't sound right, but it's a different panel altogether that's integrating the fire system, as well as if it's tripped, there's certain notifiers that should go to Oakland County Dispatch of what it is versus the fire and stuff. So it, it was a bit more complex from a technology standpoint than just putting it and integrating it into our current fire panels and buildings. Okay, and so you are looking to get quotes from Summit? Yes. Some that, okay. Yes. And the lights, will those stay the same? It will still be light for fire, yellow for yes. emergency? Okay. And then we'll be able to change the buttons because that was part of from what I'm learning right now. Um, part of the concern is now we know from meeting with them today that we can Completely customize it and so we can color code it based on how the standard response protocol is color coded as well which would then create ease for people if there's an emergency that if they know blue is secure we're not looking for the word secure because the panel buttons are small but we're looking for that blue and then we can double check secure before we press it. Okay thank you. A couple things about the reunification that I wanted to touch on. Um, I think it would be just a suggestion, but I think it would be very helpful if you had mental health professionals dispatched. We did. We have um, okay. two that I knew of. Okay. And um, one of my concerns that I think, you know, if it was obviously organized chaos, I guess we can call it, um, but there were people picking up children off the side of the road. Uh, you had panicked parents kind of driving in uh, a bit of red, kids <laughs> mingling in the parking lot, right? So it, it, there were just some other safety <coughs> concerns that I have from that perspective that I just wanted to share with you. Um, and then I wanted to ask about the secure mode or soft lockdown. I've seen some of the other buildings went into it and some did not. So could you walk us through that? So a secure is no one is allowed in or out of the building. Normal activities can happen within a building. Um, so the kids could change their classes, they could go to the restroom, if it was lunchtime, they could eat lunch. Um, but no one from the outside would be allowed in and no one from the inside would be allowed to exit. Um, we, we no longer use the term soft lockdown. I know early, and so that's not, it's just 
the way we're working on changing that language so that it's with the standard response protocol because different districts that any of us in education have worked in I've functioned under code yellow or Mr. Blue is in the building or it's this number or that so the being able to use something like the standard response protocol takes away that confusion um, we also have and I actually gave my little batch that I have to summit today to help them start working on the panel who has their badge Thank you. Every employee in the district, um, including subs, most schools have that. I will not say with 100% all the subs have it, but I can say with 100% all full-time employees. They have a, a quick cheat sheet of what the standard response protocol is, so should they have to enter into any of that, they can go, which one is secure again? Um, and again, that's just something that we're, we're continuously trying to use that language to be able to stay consistent the same way that we're going to play the sounds on the mass notification system just to bring that in and it's also in all the yellow flip charts throughout the district the front page of standard response protocol <coughs> and so to answer the other part of the question um it is a, a school choice um it, it is easy to enter into something like a secure just to ensure that they are okay until they're given any sort of all call um, other schools going into a lockdown that's rather extreme, but going into a secure, because everything's still normal, but until they felt comfortable to be able to, to open up, and that's, that's the decision of those teams. Um, I was at high school, so I wouldn't have been able, I would have gone had I not been already there at a different meeting, but that that's what we train everyone for, kind of like how students can choose to evacuate our Crisis, our campus crisis teams at each campus can choose to put them in a two of secure. Some district level staff will be getting that training as well. 
so that it's not three people owning the process, that we have a bigger group to own the process. But if those three people didn't own the process to begin with, we wouldn't have been able to even get set up what we did. But again, it's a learning process because this is our first full year with it implemented. That would be connected to the mass notification system. We're working with Summit and Reactor because of software technology things that are well above my knowledge base. Um, but that is something on the table is as we continue to be able to integrate things like our S2 graders, evolve, and slowly start to integrate everything. But that's not an easy process because you're talking different companies with different items and how are we going to get them to like each other. Okay. But that is the goal, right? Yes. To have all three of those components. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. As we're talking to this, I just had an awful <coughs> idea. I like those. So, as a parent that was there on November 30th at Meyer, when we talk about reunification, what is the opportunity to grab some of the Meyer staff. I understand there's changeover, I guess it's retail, right? But the store manager, if nothing else, to be in line with our reunification process to help coordinate once they're there because they're already there before we get there. Mm -hmm. And I'm completely open to that. That's something we've been working with Crossroads with their camp open staff and making sure that they're trained in what we do. I see absolutely no problem because things like the standard response protocol, standard reunification, that's all publicly available information and that actually would be good for a retail environment to this have community involved like that. I think it might bring more mm -hmm. community to support our children in an event like this. Yep. I yeah. think that's a great idea. Okay. Yes. So I do want to say that I was there at Myers. Uh, my son was in the lunchroom up there and I asked him when he got there if he stayed the Thursday to staff students, you know, what was going on. Um, he explained that he's there with a bunch of kids and he didn't know exactly what was going on. So I went up there. Um, I, I want to echo the praises to Meyer staff because they not have one, they, I want to say it was 10 to 15 staff there, um, all around talking to the kids. They brought out the water, they brought out the snacks. And then when our reunification teams got there and started giving directions, uh, um, the store manager, assistant manager, there was another director that was there, was asking, what do you need from us? How can we help? And, and stuff. So, from a community aspect, I think it didn't matter who was there, they just all came up. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, some of the people that were there were also there on November 30th, so it was a little bit triggering for them, but they were able to do an emotional override and, and, and say, this is what we need to do, and they, they helped out and stuff. So, to your off the wall idea, I think it happened. Um, it, it, it organically, yeah, and, and so, again, I'd like to praise the hires. I, I mean, I did it verbally to the people that were there and stuff, but. It, I mean, it was something that, I mean, we practice and we plan and tabletop exercises and a real life event, things are gonna happen. And I, I'm appreciative of the timeline and the looking back of, if it's not six months down the road, it's this happened last week, what can we learn from it? What can we do better and stuff? Um, and, and once the people got there and we started getting organized of what's going on, even the parents just giving them a little bit of information there, seem to calm them a little bit and stuff. Um, and once they come up, the kids are at the high school and give them the correct direction of where they need to go and stuff. I mean, it, it was a bad situation in many different things, but I think it went fairly well. And there's been parents in the community that have come up and said, you know what, I'm really appreciative of the staff at the high school telling my kids to lock down. I'm appreciative of the Myers employees that were there, appreciative of the Taco Bell employees that didn't ask my kids any questions when they showed up there and said, we're gonna hang out till our parents show up. I mean, as a community as a whole, I mean, everybody just they sat in the action to do what we're So it was good. I guess to be clear, I'm not questioning no, any no. of it. No, 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 I think it's a great idea but because they organically thing. jumped in yeah. from what James is saying as Which well as what amazing. I have from my reunification team, but to formalize that a little bit more, I think that's a great idea because why wouldn't we want to let them know, like, hey, you could set up the room this way. And there was a good diagram that my team was able to show me after the fact of what they did, but that's some preemptive things that we can pull cashiers who or stock people who may not have the training, but we can say, hey, move a table over here. And then that just just saved three minutes when they get there, so then we are able to get parents back with their students. So I'm, I think it's a great idea. Nothing but working off the 
Well, you know, that's not there. This, it was right. No, I'm just yeah. telling you to clear. I yeah. wasn't yeah. complaining at all. I know <laughs> they're, they're amazing. But it is yeah. that idea that it's takes all of us. Level, right? And yeah. we have different locations outside of Minor that we have MOUs with already that are already willing to partner with us and open their doors to us that why wouldn't we want to agree or make them part of the process if they're already willing to take us in. And we're grateful for all of our community partners that are willing to to do that in the event we need it to. Because Meyer is for the high school, but we have other locations for other buildings in our area. I'd like to see either in the parent universities or even um, something communicated to the community on the reunification process that you showed up here at that slide. It's a nice video that the I Love You Guys Foundation has. It's about four minutes, so we can. Okay. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it's even more important now that we, we had this and, and parents that were confused with the process and, and you, you see where I said and I got there and I was a little confused until I got direction from the reunification team and stuff. But knowing that ahead of time in a perfect world, it'd be great. But at least they understand what to expect or have that expectation mm -hmm. set of this is what's going to happen. And and once we started working as, as the staff was there, the fellow board members that showed up and helped and had that flow going through, I, I could see where you know it, it worked, right? And, and the parents didn't have a problem filling out their reunification forms. So um, they gave them something to do and they're getting updates and they got their kids and stuff. So, But as far as more of what to expect for the parent side of it, Versus just showing up and then you know you're already in a panic trying to get there and you don't know what's going on. And so I think that's a great idea too. And we had to work with the group that did the Alice training video, the Metlock training video last year. I had to wait for the off season to be over, but I am meeting now with that team again to start the same type of thing for our students for standard response protocol and standard communication on the student end. So why wouldn't we want to do the same thing for parents? Right. Thanks. I only had one question, Allison. And it's, it's just process related in terms of releasing the student. Is there a faster way to clear the building after the threat is done just from looking at the timeline if it was, you know, communication was sent out at 12, 11, 135 <coughs> over an hour. And there were a lot of updates sent out, but for the purpose of this, I just wanted to be able to show because that, that felt like multiple hours to me, but not about more teams from the sheriff's office. Okay. Because they're, they're, although Mr. Brooks, myself, um, Mr. Ward were going around with them, we still want to so make sure. So the sheriffs were the ones who had to release the students. By we were part of the teams that we did that, okay. along with Mr. Brooks, myself, Mr. Ward, to the mental health staff, and a deputy. Okay. Sounds good. Safety committee. The yes. school has a humongous footprint. It's just, right. I and understand that it's, it's extremely large, but. I know that's the kids that were last to be released were probably some of the most anxious ones at that point. I, I well. agree. Um, it's just the nature of a lot of it is the footprint of the school and where we have da dance classrooms and dressing rooms as opposed to the academic wing. Yeah, um, I get it. That, was, that chunk of time for me was 15,000 steps. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even go on the first go around as they were doing their first set. So we, we went as fast as we could but that would be just getting more people. Okay. Can you share with us how many deputies arrived to the live stream? I do not have an exact number at this moment, but that could be, I can get that to you. Yeah, I'd like to know like the initial response on how many responded and then how many we had assisting with the clearing of the building uh, of the classrooms to help expedite and, and get to it. I mean, high school is a large footprint, right? Um, and, you know, I, I just trying to, Unfortunately, fortunately, whatever, I was there on November 30th and I saw the mass response, right? And, and stuff. And this was a little bit different, is that it wasn't truly active, but it's still a threat nonetheless. We went and locked out, kids evacuated, they responded the way that they did. And I'm just trying to, to your point, Aaron, of you know, quicker clearing and helping us out. And if there's an authoritative source to say, yes, it's clear, we can do the classroom, exit them. Yeah, maybe yeah. the sheriff should have been before all the kids are evacuated. If that was or was not the case, I think it's worth asking. Okay. And one of the things, so when you when you go off lockdown, you do have to go door by door. So you can, so typically we would take sections of the building. However, if we wanted students to have mental health professionals there, that would limit our ability to 
divide and unlock doors. So I think it's worth a conversation during our processing on our action uh, after action processing on Thursday to look through how that was done because that that is an excruciating amount of time. And so if there's a way to narrow that window and get off lockdown safely as quickly as possible, we can look into that. But just so everyone knows, like the 1211 to 135, that's when that's between their first sweep. They had to do another one after. So it, it's a shorter time frame when we're looking at when they were ready, when we were told we could release versus when the district communication was first sent out. I think understanding that's important. Mm -hmm. um, because if we were notified as parents, there's a community member at 1211 that it was a false alarm and then we were still waiting for our children at 135. Well, this, this would have been that the school was on lockdown, the 1211 message that went out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, either way, if you're right, it's felt like a lot of time to get footprint, it did. there could possibly be a more efficient way to get kids out of the building. So please, thank you. Yep. All right, moving on. Um, unless you guys have other things. No? Any uh, unscheduled public comments, Kelly? for all the information about the lockdown. Um, <clears throat> I know everyone, you know, did their best, but, you know, I guess my expectation was that that mass notification system was working. Um, we had SEC come in and do an audit after the shooting. We had guideposts come in and do an audit, and I think they both made recommendations and pointed out areas having to do with like areas in the school where you couldn't hear things. And I, I thought it was all like being addressed, so I, I, I'm sort of disappointed that it wasn't, but um, I'm glad we're working on it now. Um, I'm curious what the EOP says in terms of how we notify people that we're going on lockdown, if it says we're using the PA or not. And I'm curious what our building vulnerability assessment revealed about the mass notification system. I mean, I remember the OMS thing being a big deal and that we're all, you know, shy about that thing going off accidentally and scaring all of us, but I know we can prepare the kids for it and I know we can put a plan in place for if it does go off accidentally to, to address that as well. So I'm gonna make a couple requests. The first is, um, I'd like the, I'd like you guys to consider adding students to the safety board, <clears throat> just like we have for the sex ed board. So I say that because we got a lot of feedback from our students, and they have a lot of valuable input. So I'd like us to consider adding students to this safety board. They can apply. Um, I'd like to request that we consider giving Dr. Willeman an assistant back that um, Dr. Markovich um, cost reduced because this is a lot for one person. Um, and um, that her office be located at the high school until all of this is fixed. Um, and that Dr. Um, Milligan look at the look at the EOP and the vulnerability assessments and see what those revealed in terms of the mass notification, just so that, um, you know, that we're doing the right thing for the students, that we're doing right by the students and giving them what they need. Um, real quick, my uh, brother in Atlanta, the, the, the screens in the students' classrooms, the smart screens, all um, show lockdown when their students go into lockdown. So like something takes over that system and it shows lockdown, and then any messaging that's coming over also shows up on that screen. So all the students have the visual 
and potentially um, the audio in their classroom. And it seems like a nice system. He sent me pictures. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Um, the topic I wanted to talk about today may seem a little bit about a place this evening given the heaviness of the discussion, but I just really wanted to highlight um, and request uh, continuance of the summer camp programs and the extended day program. So I'm a full-time uh, working mom, family, and without the summer camps and the extended daycare before and after, I don't know what I would do. I have an, um, a son at OELC and Kate Prop and I have a daughter at OES, and they've been part of the full-time summer and extended day programs for the last three years. And it just really gives me a sense of ease and going to work every day to know that my kids are taken care of. They're open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. My kids aren't there that long, but I know a lot of kids who are, and I don't know what we would do without the type of program that's there and the staff that is dedicated. There's no turnover. Um, I've been to other daycares and um, similar programs elsewhere um, where there's a lot of turnover, hard to retain staff, um, and the talent that we all see has is really beyond compare. I have colleagues who struggle every summer to try to find and juggle all the different multiple camps and the fact that they're only from like nine to three. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that to the board and just request that those types of programs continue for our students. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, item number 11 on the agenda is closed session. Can I get a motion to read my Waldron? Move to meet in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, Section 8.1a, to consider periodic personnel evaluation of an employee. If the named individual requests a closed session pursuant to MCL 15.2681a. Support, James. Roll call vote, James. Or discussion. Roll call vote, James. All. Yes. McDonald? Yes. Schultz? Yes. Whitney? Yes. Summers? Yes. Ashton? Yes. Reese? Yes. Going into closed session at 9.03 p.m. Thumbs up from OCTV. It is 10.06. We're returning from closed session. Um, any final board comments? Make sure to vote. Election day is coming up. Uh, any administrative clarification? Meeting is adjourned at 10 6 p.m. Mm -hmm.